Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us on FAC Connect today for our event, The Gloria's Conversation, Theater, Education, and Activism. My name is Ryan Banagali, and I am a professor of music history in the Colorado College Music Department. I'm also the college's director of performing arts. Uh, the Office of Performing Arts amplifies the role of the arts in the academic mission of the college, uh, supporting collaborative and creative impulses across our campus community. Uh, this includes the programming and endeavors of the uh, Colorado College academic departments and programs, our wonderful co-curricular student groups, and the Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center at Colorado College. And we spend a lot of time facilitating interdisciplinary connections between the arts as well as build bridges between the arts and other academic areas of the college, as well as the community and further beyond. So we've got the example of tonight where we get the opportunity to work with other institutions in, such as the University of California, Riverside, and so happy to have, have them in co as co-partners and co-sponsors of tonight's event. Um, I would like to note that Colorado College and the Colorado Springs Fine Arts Center um, at Colorado College are located within the unceded territory of the Ute peoples. The earliest documented peoples also include the Apache, Arapaho, Comanche, and Cheyenne, and ask you to join me in acknowledging these communities, uh, their elders, both past and present, as well as future generations. Uh, Colorado College and the Fine Arts Center also acknowledge that it was founded upon exclusions and erasures of many in indigenous peoples, including those on whose land our location is located. Uh, this acknowledgement demonstrates a commitment to bringing the process, uh, to, to the beginning of the process of working to dismantle the ongoing legacies of settler colonialism. Now, before I introduce our moderator for today, I'd also like to acknowledge the efforts of a few of our staff members that have been working here behind the scenes to make all of this happen. And this includes Kate Fredoni, Mo Gatson, Julia Barrett, Michelle Winchell, Winchell Dory Mitchell, Serena Wolford, and Ji Su Yim here in Colorado, as well as Sari Aguilar and Ben Tusher in California. Um, I hope that everyone here has had the opportunity to watch the incredible filmic, uh, um, filmic experience that is The Glorias, uh, and I'm very much looking forward to listening and learning from our esteemed guests today. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome to the screen our moderator, Professor Micah Espinoza. Hi. Hello, nice Thank to see you. you. Uh, let me say a few words of introduction for you before I pass it off. Um, Professor Espinoza is uh, an Arizona-based interdisciplinary performing artist, activist, teacher, voice, speech, and dialect coach who has performed and taught globally. She's an associate professor of, uh, at Arizona State University and an award-winning editor for the books Monologues for Latino Actors and Scene Book for Latinx Actors. Professor Espinoza is passionate about global and feminist perspectives and the culture, cultural voice and her scholarship, artivism, and creative research all seek to challenge systems of inequality and Eurocentrism. Professor Espinoza, take it away. Oh, thank you, Ryan. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. I'm Mike Espinoza and welcome to The Glorious Conversation, a discussion about the recently re released film that chronicles the life of Gloria Steinem, one of the iconic leaders of the feminist movement and the role of theater in education and activism. We have with us today the director and screenwriter for The Glorias, Academy Award nominated and Tony Award winning director and writer, Julie Taymor. Nice to see you. Nice to see you. We just found out that we have a mutual friend in common, so that was really fun. <laughs> Yeah. Halfway around the world, too, right? Exactly, in Indonesia. Mm -hmm. And also today, we have UC Riverside professor, playwright, and critically acclaimed actress and directory, director, Kimberly Guerrero, who plays Wilma Mankiller, the most notable female chief in modern history. Welcome, Kimberly. Thank you. Thanks, Micah. Hi, Julie. Hi. Oh, so good to see you. Me, too. And Colorado college professor, playwright, and critically acclaimed actress, Monica Sanchez, who plays Dolores Huerta, the labor activist and organizer. Monica. So I'm just so thrilled to be in this room with such phenomenal um, theater artists, world creators. And um, the first question, I wanna dive right into it, 
is that I want to talk about the first section of the film. We learn in the beginning of the film about all those early imprints that made her older self able to fight for justice. Uh, young Gloria feels her parents' economic woes, their, their health problems, their marriage issues. She learned from her life on the road and she learned female and Eastern perspectives. She learned to listen to women's stories. I would love to hear from each of you a, a seminal moment or an event in your life that led you to theater and activism. Who are you going to tell? Ask which one? Yeah. So who would like to go first? Everyone, you have to direct me. Okay, we'll start with you, Kimberly. Let's start with you. What? How did you know you wanted to be a theater artist? And I know that your work. Um, that that you're very much about uh, representation. Uh, tell us what brought you all to this work. Well, I think you know, like like many of you, um, just there's that first moment you go on stage and everybody else is terrified, and you're like, I could do this all day long. I got a captive audience. <laughs> that was like kindergarten for me. Huge ham. That's how I found. That's how I found the stage. Um, but as far as in in terms of both education and activism. Um, I was doing a soap opera with Julianne Moore, ironically. Um, she'd done it just before me, As World Turns in New York City. And I was living in New York City. And we got a, uh, CBS got a call. I mean, like the main switchboard got a call from the Lower Rural Indian Reservation in South Dakota. And they wanted, they said, hey, you've got an Indian girl on television. We wanted to come to our reservation and talk to our kids. And so this was back in 19, probably 92. And so I'm like, yes, I want to go. And so I, I went back and I kind of did a little motivational speech for the students. And they're like, well, come back, you know, come back next, you know, next quarter or next semester. So I just kept coming back at the Lower Rural Reservation. And I, but I exhausted everything I knew how to talk, <laughs> I knew to talk about. <laughs> they like, they'd heard all my stories. <laughs> We'd done all the goal setting things. And I was like, well, shoot, I should just teach them to do what I do. And that was the moment for me. It was, was that when things really um, found traction in my life and my purpose was, you know, just going in with these students and just watching them take the concept of, cre you know, uh, creating story, creating drama, creating these situations and inhabiting these characters and writing their own work and performing their own work in front of everybody. And it just seemed like such a natural fit. And it was like, well done, Native people are storytellers at our heart. It's what we've done for thousands of years. And so that then became kind of a, a trajectory for me and the one that I'm still on. Monica, do you have a moment? You know, there were so many moments, but I think one that's particularly relative to this conversation has to do with the time in my life when I was um, a young actor and I moved from my native New Mexico to California to residence with El Teatro Campesino for I spent one year with them. And this was a theater company that was born on the strike lines along with Cesar Chavez and Dolores Huerta that was actually formed to, to highlight and illustrate uh, the labor movement of the farm workers and to empower the, the, the campesinos, the pickers at that time. So it was immediate, an immediate and direct relationship between creating theater and activism. And shortly after that, I went to, uh, I moved to San Francisco and I spent the next few years working off and on with the San Francisco Mime Troupe, which is also, as we know, like a uh, quintessential agitprop theater at its best. And it was also where Luis Valdez, who formed the Teatro Campesino, wow. uh, trained. So there's um, there's a lineage to the work, mm -hmm. the theater work, and also to the activist work. And I think they've always been intertwined for me. Mm -hmm. And Julie? Well, I'm, I'm, I've been in theater since I was about eight years old. And I'm trying to think about the activism part of it. I would say that when I was about 14 or 15, I joined Theater Workshop of Boston, which Julie Portman had run originally. And I was I was very, very young to be, I wasn't really a full out member. Then she left and Barbara Linden took over. But the pieces that, that I was a part of, first was Riot. And, you know, we're talking about in the 19, 
well, the 70s, I guess, at that time. And uh, and the second piece, which I was much more involved with, and I know I was it was before I graduated high school because I I went to Paris after that. It was called Tribe, and it was about the Native American. I mean, I don't even think Kimberly, really, I even told you this because I forgot. Ooh. But it was I I that's where I started. I was in the Navajo tribe. I was put into the Navajo tribe. So at that time, it was okay for white girls to to do that experience, you know. <laughs> It'll, we'll get there again when people will want to shift, but I understand what needs to be done right now. But, but I, we, so we did that on, on, you know, that was the beginning for me of really doing, I wouldn't say it's agitprop theater, but it was political theater. It was social political theater. And I had, I had done theater all my life, but I wanted to be an anthropologist. So I, I left Oberlin, um, my college, and I, I went to study at Columbia University with Margaret Mead. And, you know, for me, my I studied shamanism even when I was back at Oberlin, but that was my emphasis. So as a shaman, you know that shamans are the first artists, directors, mm -hmm. psychoanalysts, mm -hmm. political leaders. So the first piece I ever did was uh, Way of Snow, Jalanya Salju. I did in Indonesia. And it was um, all done through music and imagery. And it was a trilogy, Eskimo, Indonesia, New York City trilogy, and it was about insanity and survival. Um, and and many things that I had studied, but I also was so inspired by the stories and the folklore and mythology, because that's really what my emphasis was. So I wouldn't say my activism is the literal kind of, you know, let's go out in the street. That's not it. My my activism is just being an artist and telling <laughs> people's lives that affects people's lives. Gloria's is probably the most overtly political piece I've done. Across the Universe had that as well because it was a Beatles musical, but it was very much about the Vietnam War and about commitment to a cause and racism and all kinds of things that were going on in the 60s. I mean, I'm, I'm treading in the same time period with the Glorious, but from totally different vantage points and styles. Um, so that, that I would say that that was the earliest, uh, the beginning, but my mom and my sister are political people. My mom's 99, she wrote a book called Running Against the Wind. She's seen the glory five times. I think it's because she forgets that she saw it, but but she, she says it's my best film because she identifies. Mm -hmm. But my mother was one of the early political um, democratic leaders in Massachusetts and she started programs to get women involved in politics. So there, she, there's the Betty Tamor Fund. There are programs at Boston College and, and UMass. I, I mean, there are about five or six. So I grew up, I canvassed with my mom when she ran for state representative and had women slamming the door in her face saying, go take care of your kids. You know, this is early times when I was 12. And, uh, and my mom said, my daughter's right here with me. So Gloria, Gloria knows my mom and really respects her. And my sister was a radical. So my sister was one of the uh, leaders of SDS, and Lucy is very, very modeled after my sister in a certain way. So it's in the blood. It's in the bloodstream in the family, but it comes out in, in different modes. Thank you. I'm going to move on because I have so many questions, and I know we're not going to get through them all, but let's continue. Uh, I love how the film highlights the importance of women of color who are also at the forefront of the second wave feminist movement, especially in including a uh, woman man killer and Dolores Huerta. How did you approach, um, how did your approach to theater and education inform character development? Um, and, and that could be for any of you. So why don't we go ahead and start with you, Kimberly? Um, well, I, Help me, help me like hold on to exactly what you want me to. There's just so much to talk about when it comes yeah, to, I have to talk about what you know. I'm thinking that, um, through the lens of this film and thinking of theater and education, uh, I'm wondering what did you do to prepare for, to play this role? What, what did how did you enter the character? Right, okay, so obviously um, from a theater experience, we all have our own processes that we work on. Suzuki method was very important for me um, in getting, I, I'm up here, Kimberly lives up here, Wilma does not. 
You know, mm -hmm. Wilma is of the earth. She is a Huma human being of the earth. And and um, so Suzuki helped get me grounded into that. Um, education kind of goes to Julie's point about anthropology of just, you know, I had had the blessing of getting to play Wilma for the Cherokee Word for Water and had gone back to Oklahoma in 2013. And um, my family lives in Tahlequah. So I was able to spend a lot of time, like a month before we started shooting. And so asking my, my little sister was uh, work at Cherokee Nation and was one of her, was with Wilma doing video. She was her videographer. So getting these, you know, really specific stories about Wilma and learning from her daughters, um, Felicia and Gina, and from Charlie Soap, her widower, and um, just taking in all of these stories. And then I would travel around again, it goes back to anthropology. I would travel around and everybody I would ask, no matter where it was a gas station or we were going to work with the community um, out in Cherokee Nation, I would say, tell me a story about Wilma, you know? And, and so I started gathering all of these stories. And so that's how um, I was able to ingest all of these stories. Mm -hmm. And then the stories then became uh, what you see on screen. And the beautiful thing about getting to work with Julie uh, and, and, and approaching this other part of Wilma's life, especially the love story between she and Gloria. Oh, and Gloria, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, just, I mean, there's just such a deep, deep abiding. And, and I was even using that when I was working on Cherokee Work for Water, even though it wasn't, she had not yet met Gloria at that point. But there was something about their their sisterhood and their relationship um, that when I was able to then get back in, into, Wil Wilma was able to get back into my body um, and I was get to, to, I was able to engage with this love story with with Gloria. It was just this immediate visceral thing, and to be able to, I told Julie the last time we had a, a panel like this, what a gift it was just to audition, and that it gave me the closure that I didn't know I needed spiritually. And so when I actually got the role and I actually got to come to work with Julie, um, it was just it will always be one of the greatest gifts of my life. Because at that point, those good seeds had been planted deep into my being. And then it was just a matter of, you know, Julie had written this really, and Sarah had written this really beautiful script. And you've got Julie directing and Rodrigo Prieto, you know, photography. And Monica and I are hanging out, you know, on, on the side, like talking about all the things, you know, so it's just this very rich, um, this rich experience. And that's what you see. So it's that's where I think I, all of that kind of intersects for me, creating more. Thank you, thank you. And let um, me just add just about about um, her, Kimberly. That scene, uh, her death scene, or prior to her death, is the longest scene in the movie. It is the it is the actual most emotional, and and I I really wanted to give it time because I think even though the mother is critical and I adore Enid Graham and all that, that death was not the thing that is so shocking. Death of her father, of course, is huge for Gloria. But her relationship with Kimberly, I mean Kimberly, with um, um, Wilma, they were writing a book together when Wilma died. You know, this was her, this was the love of her life, the last part of her life was Wilma Mankiller. Um, the last part of this story, this story was Wilma. I mean, there are other women now, but that that was meaningful and i i cast kimberly not just because she's a good actress but i actually cast the two of them mo brings plenty and kimberly because mo played her husband charlie in the film uh that she had done and i found rather than being frightened of them bringing an idea that because they i found that to be a plus i have to say that's that to me meant that okay we don't have a lot of time on a film shoot like this they've done the work they've lived the young life of that couple They've lived it because that movie is earlier. It's not the last years. Mm -hmm. So when they got together, you hadn't seen each other for a while, right? No, no, ten years or something. So when they came together, it was it was a reunion of a married couple, and that that's evident to me in the film. I mean, you don't get the kind of rehearsal time that we all know that theater gives us. There was no rehearsal. There was absolutely no rehearsal for them. They come on the set. They have to be ready. Um, so. The fact that these women have this extraordinary background was appealing to me because I am from that world and I know that they do their work. So that's one of the reasons, you know, that she was cast. And, and now you're going to tell us, Monica, <laughs> get your process. Yeah, well, I'm so I'm encapsulated in the in these in your stories too. I forgot I'm actually on the panel. 
<laughs> yeah, well, for me, you know, it's like, first of all, it's incredibly daunting to play an icon like Dolores mm -hmm. and who also happens to still be living. And I just knew from the beginning, there was really no way I could actually do justice to the woman. So I have to think about doing justice to, for the film. Like what's my role, what's my cog in this storytelling machine. Mm -hmm. That said, um, I've actually, I've met Dolores. I had met her a few times. I know some of her family. I went back to um, Peter Bratt's brilliant documentary on her, oh, Dolores. Yeah. And I also, uh, he was kind enough to share his time with me. I had a few conversations with him where I would follow up and ask him questions. Mm -hmm. And then I also, um, one of my, you know, for me, it's not so crazy, but perhaps to some, an unorthodox acting technique or research technique is uh, I did her astrological chart. And, <laughs> and I discovered she's an Aries. She has a lot of fire and a lot of air. I am actually a lot of earth, you know? And the one thing that, you know, and, you know, Julianne Moore just is a shapeshifter. She completely embodied the cadence, the voice, the body of Gloria Steinem. And I knew I could not do that. And I didn't ap approach it or try to even attempt an impersonation. It was looking at, try to create some kind of essence and look at what is my job as a character in this moment in the film mm -hmm. to add to the story and to move it forward. Mm -hmm. Yeah, ooh, I've got lightning here and the wind is going and a storm is brewing. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> we're dry oh, as a bone. Oh, oh, my dog is freaking out. Okay. Ooh, the background. So that's why my computer probably is bad. I just saw my internet. I might drop out if this, because I'm on an island. So I, I wanted to say about about Dolores. I don't think Dolores where it does, it, I think it's in the book, not the second scene. There's only two scenes. And, you know, you, you I wanted Dolores in there because I felt like oh, when, when Dorothy Pittman Hughes and Gloria Steinem helped her in New York, um, it wasn't feminism mm -hmm. that they were fighting for. It was causes. And I think they were both incredibly inspired by, by Dolores Huerta. And I also found, when I found out that Cisne Puede was hers, was Dolores's, I went, oh my God, we got to correct this one. You know, yes, we can. But the second scene is what is interesting because that didn't happen at the Houston Women's Conference in 77. I had seen the movie about the documentary about Dolores Huerta and I was so blown away by her and what she said and her journey. And I knew that abortion is a big part of this story. The, the, book, the book is dedicated to the London doctor who approved Gloria for getting an abortion at age 20, 21. And, you know, and that scene is in there. And I thought that was incredibly bold to, you know, to do that with your, your book. You know, it's the uh, right at the top. But I, I, and I know we talk about abortion through the movie, you know, and you've got various scenes, but I was looking for the, 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 the point of view of someone who was anti-abortion and was a, a person that you would admire, that you knew was an activist, wasn't just a crazy old village Schlafly type, you know what I mean? Wasn't, wasn't uh, the other side of the fence. Someone who really had religious deep reasons for being anti-abortion, mm -hmm. but had changed. And I learned, I think through the documentary that Gloria had inspired Dolores to Change yes, Dolores calls herself a born again feminist. Born again feminist. No, so, but she saw Dolores talks about us seeing the women workers, the farm workers going through hell. So I wrote that scene and I put it there because I did know that Dolores had been to the Phyllis Schlafly anti ERA meeting. She had been there. So that wasn't made up. But I, I didn't think it wasn't all in one meeting like that where Gloria says, you know, I want you to see. That was artistic freedom. So I called up Gloria and I said, is this okay? This scene, I'm writing this scene because I think it's important when you're discussing something, it can't be just black and white. You know, it can't just be you're for or you're against. I love the idea that you can be anti-abortion and pro-choice. And I don't think that, that, that you can be pro-life and pro-choice. Pro-life 
and pro-choice. And I don't think that we make enough of those distinctions. So it becomes like our country right now, you're either with it or against it. You know, it's like totally divided. And I felt Dolores, who we respect and admire, and she says, and you see her suffering. And I think Monica is astounding in that scene. I mean, I adore her performance. And it is interesting to spend that much time when you're writing and directing a movie on a character who is so minor. I mean, seriously, she's not minor anymore at all because she's been positioned the two big scenes she's positioned there to be, you know, to be the um, the change agent. You know, she is there. Not that Gloria changes, but how Gloria has very calmly, without militancy, been able to talk with someone about their lives. When Gloria says, "None of us are pro-abortion. We don't get up in the morning. Go oh, great. We're going to have a you know a procedure today." But we don't want our bodies nationalized. She doesn't say that. She says that now. I love that. Because we talked about Ruth Bader Ginsburg and what's happening with Roe v. Wade being on the chopping block and all of that. So I was thrilled when both Dolores and Gloria said, do it. I, we give you permission. We know it's not true. But what Gloria always said about truth in the movie, when there, when you, know, you have to economize or do this and that, she said, if it's emotionally truthful, it's okay. If it's emotionally truthful, and so that having your, your you know your star, meaning the subject matter, be able to answer your questions and your fears was Frida was not alive. You know you have to take liberties. The only person who was alive was Chavela Vargas, who slept, who was a lover of Frida. So and I dealt. I that's a whole nother story. How I came to to work with Chavela, but um, in this case, I'm so happy to be doing this with these two women because. You know, they're not the movie stars like Bette Midler or, you know, Janelle. I mean, I think, I hope they are now, frankly. I, but because I, I, they know that in the teaser and everywhere else to me, yes. it's a love story between Gloria and these women. And it's not just women of color. I know we say that all the time. But, but Gloria acknowledges and knows that these are the women who really, without any kudos, without any not acknowledgement without any press are the women, the African American women, way back. If you watch that thing on the vote on voting that's yeah. on PBS now, go look at Ida B. Wells and all the African American women who were disenfranchised from being part of the suffragette movement, not because all the suffragettes wanted it, but they made a choice. They said they knew that white men were not going to allow this to happen if black women or women of color were a part of it. It is outrageous because the African-American women and women of color were there at the forefront, more, look, more voted for Hillary Clinton per capita, as Gloria says, more African-American women voted for Hillary than white women did. You know, I mean, they're, they're ahead of it. All, all, all these incredible women. And in that time, Bella Abzu, being Jewish, is a woman of color because nobody liked that. She could, she should have been mayor. You know, she was an amazing woman. I'm not even sure that's changed right now, but but it, it, then definitely, you know, in that time, that was a that, there was a lot of of, of hatred. Uh, maybe not on the level, you know, that it was for for other women. But so anyway, I'm so happy to be on this panel here because I love these actresses. And by the way, you're going to be Kimberly. I heard you're going to be in my friend movie. Yes, I just met with, thank you, Julie. I just found yeah, out. Well, like, yeah. good. And actually, like, how is she to work with? I said, hey, me, if you can get Kimberly Guerrero, don't, just don't go anywhere else, you know? Oh, thank you. Yeah, so she's got, she's got I, I don't know what it is, but she's got a part to act now during COVID in Montana, right? <laughs> good deal. In Montana, yes. <laughs> well, I'm so glad that we spoke about that moment because that was one of the moments that I did want to discuss. It's, um, you know, the phenomenon of Marianismo that where the woman must be like the Virgin Mary in, Latin, um, in Latino culture and the role of the mother and how that, um, how that um, affects us. Um, it's something that um, I think women struggle with today. It's not something that's gone away. And so I think it was a really important moment in the film. So I, I thank you for putting it in there because it was, it was definitely something that, that spoke to me. Um, and it made me really think, oh, well, how far have we come? And where are we right now in this moment? So we're where a new Supreme Court justice I just read is was a handmaid. 
a handmaid in a in a kind of not a cult, but in a whole religious Christian group. You know, handmaid's tale. Just, women are subservient to men. This is Amy Coney Coney, whatever her name is, Brandt. You're right. Yeah. Fair, I believe. Whatever, the woman who started the super spreading. That's all I know. I don't know if she started it, but but certainly at the Rose, the Rose Tea Party, that was where, where it got started. But um, yeah, I mean, this is the woman who's going to take Ruth Bader Ginsburg's place. Uh, we're in trouble, deep trouble. So, you know, important that anybody get the glory is out there quickly if people are on the fence, because there's no fence you can be on. There really isn't. You either have your, your your America destroyed, or we have hope, and uh, that's it. There's just no there's no choice really. Yeah, and this you know you brought up the the suffragette movement. I just is unthinkable to me. I don't understand the people who do not exercise are not exercising their right, their duty, their responsibility to vote right now after all of the sacrifices that so many people made. For so long, I mean, it's been. They went to jail. Years. Those women. They were in jail over and over again for yeah. protesting for the right to vote. You right. know, and they still don't have complete voter rights. It's. I mean, no. it's been a hundred years yeah. since we got the amendment. It's a hundred years, and it's, and we're still look trying to find justice within accessibility for voters. Yeah. Before that, the women who started the movement didn't live to see it finished. It's a long, it's a process, it's a long struggle and we have to be a part of it in the most fundamental way that we all can, that we all have access to. Maybe everybody can't go into the street, maybe everybody can't teach at a college, but we can all vote. And it's astounding to me that we, that there are people that are one, undecided, two, decided not to vote. Well, I mean, the scary part is that these, these states, uh, you know, there's one mailbox or one whatever voter reg, voter box. Voter suppression. And all. So what does that mean? I mean, vote right away. I vote. I Where is it? My ballot's right on the table. I'm sending it tomorrow because it's absentee. But I'm in New York. You know, I'm a New York voter. That's, that's kind of, you know, still you have to vote. I get really worried that many Democrats will, young people go, oh, he's got it in this place, this place. I don't have to vote. No. There's a, another article I'm obsessed now where these 95 year olds, there's a whole one about old people who are even on deathbed. They've got cancer, they're going to die, they're not going to see what the president saying. I was there in 1942 when I voted, and I'd be damned if I'm not going to get my ballot out and die, but it's going to be for Biden. I mean, there are a few for Trump. But basically, these older voters are saying, Two things. I want to live one more year, and I want to vote. I want to vote because they lived during these times where that's all they had. Their only power, and really, it's the same. The only power we have is with the vote. Or so, stand in line with a mask and distance yourselves. You know, go to the grocery store. But if you can vote absentee or, or whatever it's called, not absentee. Um, what's it called? By mail. Absentee. Whatever. By mail, but they're making one thing more difficult than another. Absentee, I'm out of state, is not difficult. And I can plunk it in any mailbox, any stamp. But if you're living in the place and you want to vote by mail, you can only put your ballot in a set in a certain kind of re uh, receive, what is it? Receiving a drop box. box. A drop drop box. box. Yeah. Why can't you just put a stamp on it and mail it if you go early? I don't get it. I don't understand. Two, two, to go back to your point, Julie, about um, you just said power and the power to vote. And you were talking about, you know, your early career of, of, of a shaman and, and the power of that is that the it's there is something energetic. There's something spiritual about voting. You know, um, there is, you know, that that's an accretion of uh of energy within our country, and you're so right. There is no choice. We either we either come together and move forward, and I mean, regardless of where you lie between ultra conservative to ultra liberal, um, you know, with a, a, a sentient thinker, we'll see that this is not. There's no way to move forward um, with the with the current administration that we have. So. You know, to to take that, even if you, you know, I mean, I'm from Oklahoma, and there's no chance. You know, I mean, it's like Utah. I mean, that's no, there's Biden has no chance there. But the but the energetic 
you know, the, 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 the fact that you went and you did it, there's something to that. That's a seed, a good seed that you're planting that will come up and bear good fruit, but not unless you don't plant that seed. Yeah, well, let me ask you about Oklahoma. You have two Republican senators as well. There's no yeah. possibility to shift to flip the... Yeah, I believe we do. I believe we do. I'm not... I, I need to check back in with, you know, what's going on there currently, but... Because I think, I think you know, I mean, obviously we want Biden and Harris to win, but I think flipping the Senate is even more important, honestly, because, oh, yeah. because look at what happened to Obama. He got very little done with that Republican Senate. And I think that the Democratic Senate, that's more important, really important now. And, uh, and, and Trump will get nothing done if, if he did win and it was a Democratic House and Senate. That would be great. And also we got to have Mitch McConnell and Lindsey Graham and all those rotten, rotten human beings uh, just who are just so greedy and disgusting. Um, yeah, well, that's what we that's what, why we let the movie come out now as opposed to holding it back and letting it be in movie theaters later. I mean, I'm sorry you can't see it with a thousand people like I saw it on the premiere. It was and Charlie Soap was there. That was amazing. You know, it was just amazing uh, at Sundance. And then I did one more for 500 women in L.A. And that, you know, you get the visceral response. theater people, the audience. I got to see it play. I got to see them crying and stamping and cheering and standing ovation. Of course, it was Sundance. It wasn't just any place. But but that, I, I sat here the other night I'm on this island, and, I'm, and, I, and I don't need to watch it on Amazon Prime, but I'm going, I don't even know who saw it. It was so weird because I don't know I don't see people being affected by it. I don't get any I see a few things being written but I don't do social media I don't I don't do Facebook Twitter none of it so I am kind of wondering is anybody watching this movie I have no idea well I, I think I think that they are they very much are and I, I, from what I understand you were going to go on a, a bus tour is, is that yeah. correct Oh, um, we should be on a Greyhound bus for the swing skates. Gloria and I and any of the actors who wanted these ladies would have come. We were going to be there showing the movie to not just women's groups, but across the other side, bipartisan. We want to we show it. Have a time. Just watch it, you know? And, uh, and we didn't get to do that. So then the film distributors wanted to wait. And Gloria and I and then Hindi, our producer, said, no, we're not going to put this movie out after the election. I mean... That's not what our idea was. Our idea is to use this movie to, to, to inspire. I mean, there's something very important about the passing of RBG because very important. And Gloria, Gloria knew her, they're the same age. And, and I had to talk a lot about her the week before, the two weeks before the movie was released on Amazon. And I thought about it. The voices of Gloria and these women, these characters, these women, and, and the women now, the, the only reason Ruth Bader Ginsburg did what she did is because she heard the voices. Mm. So it's a two-part thing. She doesn't live in isolation. The Supreme Court has to listen to the tenor, to the voices, to the cries and demands of the public. And if they don't, it's marked, right? It's marked. So I feel like it's even more important that young people, about the environment, about all of the issues, racism, police, whatever it might be, whatever is the one that is most meaningful to you, you have to speak up. Across the Universe was about that too. Yes. When Lucy says, I'd lie down in front of a tank if it would bring Max home, and Jude says, I wouldn't. And then she says, well, you don't even think it's worth trying? And you know, they split apart as lovers because she becomes an activist. You know, And I, I feel like, okay, a lot of young people love that movie. Let's see her act on that movie now that you're 25. You saw it when you were 15, now you're 25. So use your voice. Don't just, as, as Gloria says beautifully, pressing send is not enough, you know? In the, in the movie, um, one of my favorite moments as a voice teacher, I was just thrilled that you included this, that, that she was afraid to speak. <laughs> and, and she was nervous and quaking. And I think that when you first find your way to justice, your body quakes, your voice quakes, and then her, her quote, of course, of you're, first you're going to get angry, um, and then and then you're going to uh, get pissed, then, pissed off. Yeah, first you're going to get pissed off, off and, and then you're going to do something about it. Um, I'd love to know, um, you know, 
I'm just so thrilled that you put that in there. But what are there moments where you knew that oh, this is a this is something I have to to speak up for? Uh, and did that come naturally to you, Julie? Did it come naturally to just well, stand for things? It was in the book. It was in the book, and the reason it almost was on the chopping block. Almost, you know, you have to think about it. Do we need that scene? But because I was trying to speak with this movie to all the people who think they can't be a glorious dynamo. Exactly. I, I, I wanted to show that it, she's not born that way. She didn't, she wanted to be a dancer and she failed at that. And coming to be an activist isn't something she searched to do. She didn't sign up on a course. She was in India. She was brought in by this woman to talking circles in a, in a village that had cast riots and she listened. Mm. And Gloria's greatest strength is her listening. She's called a celestial bartender. She listens. She gets people to, you know, to talk. That's the opposite of what's happening now in the top of our government. That person doesn't listen to anything. Doesn't even hear himself, really. Because then he'd go, what did I just say? <laughs> but I, I, I really... I really felt that, and there's also that wonderful um, article that Gloria wrote the day after the election, four years ago, where she says that Hillary's loss, it's a relay race. It's a very beautiful thing that she, that she uh, wrote, which is that women, you know, pass the torch, pass the, rel the relay race. So what happened two years ago, the Congress had all these women come in, women of color, all kinds of women came in. So the reason I asked Kimberly that was because Native Americans in Oklahoma should be the senators there. There's no doubt about that. I know you've got some very good people there. The guy Tom, Tom, Tom Cole is Republican and he is Native, but yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, he shouldn't be a Republican then, should he? <laughs> I agree. And yet, possible. But I, but I think that that women, you need a you need a woman. You need a woman Native American. Um, you know, I think that this is what, what having the scene with the, vo the, the vocal coach um, shows you is that she was, she went, I, lo I just love the idea that it felt like she had a Gora sweater wrapped around her teeth. You know, just that image alone is the glorious sign of, you know, what did it feel like to talk? Mm -hmm. and, and how kind and gentle and encouraging uh, Dorothy Pittman is, as played by Janelle Monet. There's just this incredible women helping women. You know, I didn't yeah. want to do a movie about women at women, women fight chatting and women competing. And, you know, it's the opposite of Mrs. America, frankly, this, this, this telling. First of all, there were no real Shirley Chisholm. There was not really, the women of color were not in that movie, that TV series. They were hardly in it. They were in the kitchen a lot, but they were hardly in it. So... I, I know that Gloria really disliked that script and, and said what it's a dishonest script about the ERA, about bills, about all. Yeah, she wrote an amazing article. She waited till after the Emmy nominations. You know, she didn't want to hurt. Nobody wants to hurt the actors. You know, they were all fine. But the actual content was, again, the kind of thing. Be Betty, what was it? Uh, Davis against Joan Crawford. And yeah. you know, pitting women against each other. This is a love story our film. It's a female love story without the sex, you know? And uh, and that, so I did have the fact that definitely Gloria was a very sexy woman and had a lot of sex her whole life. That's not the issue. The issue is that this is about something we never see, which is women working with women in a very positive way. Mm -hmm. We usually see the little people. It's all about the man, you know? And if it's a road movie like Thelma and Louise, they have to die at the end and be punished. No. Right. right, right. Well, um, speaking of uh, sex, <laughs> um, the scene where um, Julianne Moore is um, playing Gloria, that highly dramatic moment where mm -hmm. the Glorias are transported into the sky and recite <laughs> yeah. Macbeth which is lines that, it, you know, I wanted to ask you, is it a curse? Is it an omen of what's to come? Uh, what did Macbeth's witches represent for you? And it's what is in the New York times right now, if you go, there's the anatomy of a scene and the New York times picked that scene. Uh, I spoke about it for 45 minutes. So it's a three minute edit of what I'm saying, but I, it's a wonderful thing because it is the most 
either hated or loved moment in the movie. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'm trying not to read reviews because I like the good ones and hate the bad ones. So, you know, I'm trying not to. But I kind of wanted to see what, because I saw a lot of men who didn't like the movie. And, and this is one of the reasons. They don't like the surrealism. They don't like me going off on my shoe. Why can't I just, you know, but that particular scene, um, the Boston Globe reporter, who a critic, said, you know, he got, he got very miffed that they went off into, these were his words, because I saw it today, feminist fury. There's no feminist fury in that. There's no fury at all. It's whimsical. It's mm. funny. They're just, it didn't really happen. And this is what, how I explain it. You know, she, she's wearing black or black uniform, which she still wears. That, that she also wears makeup occasionally or has her streaks or her glasses. Why not? Look at a, Alexandra Ocasio-Cortez. You know, look how she talks about, you know, putting on the lipstick and the eyes, but she can still do it. And who was called a bitch about a month ago on the steps of Congress? So the bitch witch phenomenon that women in power have had to confront over and over again was something that I wanted to deal with because when the Alicia Gloria hasn't found her voice yet, she's pre Ms. Magazine, she hasn't quite found it. She's astounded once again at that, and this is a real interview. This was a composite of two interviews that basically said the same thing, real interview, which is, I hope you accept my masculine notion that you are, I hope you forgive that you're an absolutely stunning sex object. Now, when women get these things thrown at them, you know, he's a nice guy and he's actually, I liked him and I thought he was handsome and I cast him and I didn't find him repulsive. He was flirting with her, right? I, I hope all the men, I like all the, pretty much most of the men in the movie, the New York Times editor, I like him. He, he thought she was hot. He thought she was great. Why not ask her to go to bed with him? You know, this is an era that young women have to see. The, 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 there was a different time and men were allowed to do that. They were allowed and unpunished. And a woman like Glory, who had no money, quit. She just leaves. That's, she's able to do that. She just decided, I'm gonna go have an ice cream. I'm not gonna work for that guy anymore. Mm -hmm. So back to this, I was doing a transition. There's two reasons this whole Wizard of Oz thing. I wanted to deal with the concept of women as bitch witch phenomenon, but also the uniforms. Because, you know, him asking about it and her saying, this is my uniform, it's more comfortable than yours with the pinch tie and the, you know, the cuffs that you go up and down. And she's saying it in a Gloria way, which is to smile, because Gloria was never confrontational. She, she, she laughs through most of her criticisms of people or things. She's, she doesn't like it. You can see that in the film. But you know, she said what she was thinking in her head. And I'm going to give you, Hillary Clinton, that's a great documentary called Hillary. It's great, by the way. It's really, if you want to understand why she is, why you, even things you hate about her, you'll understand it if you watch that, that, that documentary. But when you have the big red giant moving behind you, stalking behind you as you're trying to talk in the presidential debate, she probably had a little movie going on in her head. What's this guy doing? You know, is he spewing on me? Is he, what's he doing? You know, she would have had a whole nother movie going on in here. And she said that, but she could never say what she felt. She couldn't turn around and say, will you just stop that? Because people would go, oh, she can't handle it. Oh, she's a bitch. Oh, she's that. Okay, so I wanted to do what could be three seconds, which really, she's only quiet for three seconds, right? That's really, she's not saying anything. She's so aghast at, the, at this question that she's not speaking. So that was my way to do the transition into the next Gloria, which is the one who finds her voice through Ms. Magazine and through the other women. And and then we see the, 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 the uniforms. I started, my first idea was a burqa. And I think that Alicia said, I won't do that. I grew up with Muslim women and I, I'm not gonna wear that. So I said, you're right, you're absolutely right. Not that men in countries where women wear burqas don't make them wear sexy underwear underneath. I'm not saying that in general. I'm just saying the phenomenon of men wanting women who are completely closed is even sexier because then they own it. You know, they own that woman can only be seen by the one man, right? By the one man. But I know I know that could be offensive, and who am I to do that? I don't have a right. So I played with the nun, the idea of the nun and the handmaid. So you have uh, the muzzled handmaid, and 
well, do you like this uniform? Is this better? Is this less, you know, is this, am I, am I still gonna turn you on basically? Fly up like Marilyn Monroe with the air flying up her, her dress. And there she is in the bunny uniform. And that was around, when I wrote that, that was around, I can grab any pussy and nobody would, you know. So grab my tail, that's what it's there for. And then we have the little girl and the phenomenon in Japan, in, in, you know, expressly in Japan, of pornography with little girls in school, school uniforms. That's, there's a lot of that in many countries. And then she sits on his lap, what's, what's is that song, Jack? It just breaks your heart. And then the little, the other one. And then we go into full, Wizard of Oz. Now, why did I go into Wizard of Oz? It's it's in her book, and you even hear about it when she when she reads from her book in the Indian bookstore later, um, of this desire of going home. You know, she talks about it from a different place. But the bitch witch thing all coalesces in that that tornado, which is wow. Let's just sweep him up. Let's just take him and twirl him around and be the three witches of Macbeth and be flying on. Harry Potter broom that's burning and you know this is the women oh my god they're so frightening and horrible and you know it's funny I mean, it's it's whimsical it's whimsical but I'm telling you it makes people some people upset and mm -hmm. and I've succeeded because it's like it's like when uh, she's at the uh, Harvard Law thing and she and he says how dare you you have no right to talk here and she's quiet and Flo Kennedy in her ear says just wait, wait, and then you say, I didn't pay him to say that. So that's what I feel about that critic in Boston. I didn't pay him to say that, but he just exposed himself by, by calling feminist fury, because that's what it is. If she had said, if Gloria had said to that guy openly, you, do you know what you're saying? You know, what you just said to me? If she actually said what she was thinking, he would have been thinking, a uh, bitch. I was flirting with her. And this is how she talks to me. She patronizes me. She gives me a lesson. So, and then we come back to the reality and the TV producer and the, um, you know, the director behind the glass says, what's she doing? And his email assistant says, not answering him. And then we we switched to Julianne. So for me, it was halfway through the movie. I needed to find a good transition to go from the Alicia being the dominant Gloria, even though they jump around, to um, now we're moving into the next stage of, of her 40 onwards, and that's Julianne. And the next scene, we have Kali and the demons. And, you know, she thank you for that gift because we're going to need her. Um, talk about feminine fury, that would be Kali. Uh, but we don't really get into that. Well, I appreciated very much that moment in the movie because there was no Me Too movement many years ago. There, there were no intimacy directors on set. And so um, I, I completely understood it and, and felt it. Um, so I, I loved it. Um, I would like uh, yeah, to- It's not women who, I mean, some older women get a little antsy about it because they say, did Gloria really feel that? Think there is a point, and Gloria has said this, where the artist gets to interpret something. I'm not doing, I'm not doing a documentary, guys. I'm doing my take as the co-writer and director of this story. And the Gloria's is not just Gloria Steinem, right? Is it? No, no. So, so you know, we as as director writers, we interpret the material. So yes, maybe the flight of fancy was a little more off on that one, but it's the way I think, and it comes naturally. Well, it was wonderful. Uh, Kimberly and, and Monica, uh, I know many of your students are watching, and so I want to give you a moment to to speak to them uh, about, about this subject, about um, what it is to be uh, an actor in uh, the business and how that has changed for you. Or not? I'm gonna have to leave shortly because I am committed to watching this presidential debate. So yeah, yeah, yeah. We all gotta go. So just, uh, so I want to give you guys the final word before I say thank you. <laughs> so we can like, keep it all short. So really, really quickly. You know, you all, how much I love you. I know it's not very academic of me, um, but story is medicine, and you are the medicine keepers. <laughs> and 
I so desperately, and, and all of our faculty that's watching now too, and shout out to Kirby Hines and thinking about you tomorrow. Um, but we're here to help you tell those good stories and to share that good medicine. And anything that we can do um, to help you believe in your own voice. And, and part of that is watching the glorious and, and seeing how that affects you. We'll talk about it in class and you can email me and just thank you for this time. And thank you all for giving me this um, opportunity as well. Monica. Yeah, also, hopefully quickly, is that in terms of being, you know, being a working actor for many decades now, it's, it comes a time to tell our own stories. Or it's changed very much now, but when I was a 20 year old or 30 year old Chicana actor looking for work in LA or San Francisco on the screen, there just weren't, there were this many roles. And the irony is that the older that we get, the more seasoned in our lives and in our crafts, there are fewer roles. So it's incumbent upon us to tell our own stories. And that's part of what I'm doing now in terms of, um, you know, becoming, uh, spending more time as a writer. And to, again, circle back to what Julie said in the beginning, in terms of the activism of an artist is inherent in making the art. And in terms of the theater, because what the theater provides for us is the ability to empathize with other people, with other people in the room, with other stories and lives on stage. And that's one thing I so appreciate about this telling of this film, Julie, is that because of who you are, is very theatrical. <laughs> and it's beautiful because it's not, it's not, there is more, there's truth and then there's reality. <laughs> and you've gone through the reality of the naturalism, oh. of the expressionism, through the surrealism to find a deeper tr truth. Oh. And I hope it, all, it moves all of us again to, I'm just going to say, we got to vote because we've, we're, we're in this vat of boiling water. We're the lobsters. We also can't let people know it's getting heated up and we're about to drown. So, okay. Well all right, well let's said. go root for, for Kamala. Yes, well, everyone, I hope that you. Oh, uh, yes, well, everyone, I hope that you watch The Glorias with a young person. I, I shared this film with my 14 year old son. I asked him what he learned, and he told me a lot. He had never heard of Gloria Steinem, he didn't know there was a woman's movement. He thought it was so cool that the women joined together to make a difference. This film is for everybody, so please share it with a friend, a young person, get a group of friends together to discuss men. it over men. Zoom, discuss it with men. Yes. This film is an excellent opportunity to inspire a new generation. So let's follow the lead of Gloria Steinem, Wilma Mankiller, the Lord Puerta, the activists who inspired the Me Too movement, Black Lives Matter. It's time to stand up. You can find out how to get involved. There's going to be a list of resources in the chat. And we are so privileged that you three artivists were able to join us today. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye, everyone. May this session, these incredible feminists and film inspire you to go to the polls and raise your voice. I'm Micah Espinosa, and thank you for Bye. joining me.